So we will uh, just go ahead and get started with LaRue Lewis McCoy. I'll briefly introduce each speaker before they present. Uh, LaRue is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and the Black Studies Program at the City College of New York in CUNY. His research concentrates on educational inequality in American public schools, racial identity, youth culture, and gender justice. Good morning. Uh, I'm excited because I get to go first on the panel that leads into lunch, so whoever goes fourth, good luck, because I'm sure people are looking forward to that break after such stimulating discussion on uh, a variety of topics and things that have been really interesting to me as a sociologist, right? I rarely get to sit in a room full of educators or educational specialists and really get down to the nitty gritty. And I am very happy to be present with some great colleagues and co-presenters, Dr. Harrison, McLaughlin, uh, Milliken, and especially thank you for Youth Next for bringing me here to share with you today. I want to do something a, a little bit that is a transition between the two panels that we have, right? This panel is to talk largely about communities, but I'm going to talk about communities through the frame of parents and really even networks of parents and what that means for educational engagement. So the first thing, the title of my talk is Re-Engaging Parents in Educational Advocacy. What's really important uh, to set up the background for this is that a lot of my comments are coming from a set of studies that I did in a particular district, a district that isn't very distinct or different from Albemarle County, right? It's a county of diversity, of economic diversity, of racial diversity, in which we see groups that may not come from the same social class background interacting in schools, competing for resources, and seeing school districts respond to demographic shifts. Sometimes people call these communities uh, uh, communities in transition, but I don't necessarily think they're in tr transition because oftentimes they have had a basis of a large white population and a small population of color, particularly African Americans. And what's interesting is it's only now that many of these areas are starting to deal with the issues of race and class in meaningful ways. For so many years, they've ignored them, they've marginalized communities, and simply assumed that, well, if we have a uh, sufficient number of national merit scholars, if we are making adequate yearly progress, then everything's fine. Thankfully, I think we, we have an opportunity to have a different conversation about education, educational achievement, and particularly the, the, the important role of parents. Normally, when we talk about this district, the, the, the magical term, the achievement gap, seems to overarch and guide most of our conversation. The idea that everything has to boil down to a test score or a high stakes test. And what I want to do is try to go beyond really discussion achievement, but really look at some of the more processual things that happen or the mechanisms that happen in between families, in between schools, so that they can see what matters for them and how they become engaged. Because one of the most fundamental issues around community engagement and family engagement is that there are just a lot of folks who just quote unquote, aren't there. And I've found in my research that teachers and schools tend to qualify parents into two types of categories, involved and not, right? A very binary thinking that is problematic to me as an academic, but also problematic to me as someone who thinks about the range of issues that mount on top of just the idea of being engaged in a school, considering class, considering race, considering, ge considering gender. So today what I want to do is talk about both individual and collective processes as how they relate to school engagement and hopefully shifting parents to be uh, advocates. It is based in part on families' backgrounds, it's based in part on families' negotiations and experiences with the school system, and it's based on the networks in which, and communities in which they reside. My goal is to develop strong educational advocates, but in order to do this, we have to be actively considering issues of race, class, and gender. First thing is first, right? Good, nice little research review. Parents matter in education. Family background, of course, has been found to be important and linked to student achievement. Of course, first fam famously documented by the Coleman Report. And mounds and mounds of literature suggest that where you come from matters to how far you go, how you perform, how you are engaged with school. But one of the things that matters a lot, particularly in the middle school years, are the role of parents in what I call educational customization. Not simply saying I'm gonna bring cookies in for the bake sale, but my child was placed in a, was not placed in the appropriate math class, right? And we know that at the middle school levels, that's when we start to get a lot more curricular differentiation, right? 
In the early elementary grades, there may be some degree of ability grouping, but oftentimes we're seeing kids are moving into areas where their classes matter for their trajectories, their classes matter for their friendship groups, and ultimately, parents serve as, uh, can serve in a major function as, as shifting and customizing education in public schools. As well, parents are vital to school functioning. They are the contingent or voluntary labor that schools pull from. They serve as a model to schools, so they socialize kids at home and tell them what is the value of school. They interact with school staff and try to identify their place in their location. Is this school a place that I fit in as? And of course, parents matter because teachers and administrators daily make decisions about who's going to get what and how educational resources become triage. The reality is that all parents aren't equally served by school systems, and people make calculated and rational decisions which are located in the context of a school environment and a setting. Now, I'm gonna talk uh, primarily about two models of parent engagement, and I put my biases out there up front. I'm a sociologist, right? So I'll give you two models that have come to dominate discussion around how parents become engaged in school and work with schools and the connection between home and family. And the first one, is that of Annette Leroux, right? Annette Leroux begins her work with home advantage and continues in unequal, child, uh, unequal childhoods. And she really argues fundamentally about child rearing style. The idea that among, that there are class differences that exist in people and middle class parents tend to use a style known as concerted cultivation. This is the idea that they are going to offer their children extracurricular activities. They're going to encourage their children to speak to authority figures in particular ways. They'll have very positive institutional relationships. Alternatively, LaRoe posits that there's a strategy of natural growth that is used by lower income families. More time that is independent of adults, more time that is unsupervised, and often what she calls, um, she does not call it neglect, but if you start to look at some of the evidence, she's definitely hedging on that side. The idea that the lives of low income students and families are less structured, so their relationship to institutions is less favorable, both at the child level and at the adult level. And for LaRoe's model, it is extremely class-based. Based on the, sta uh, the sample and study she found, by and large, she argued that there were not racial differences, and if there were racial differences, they were negligible. And if you all want to have a conversation, I can tell you later why I think she found that. Because ultimately, I argue that many of these things are tied to race, how families engage, how they stay engaged, or become disconnected. And alternatively, I want to offer the model of Amanda Lewis and Tyrone Foreman, who wrote a piece that centered around the question of institutional reception. Acknowledging first, all schools are not created equal. Schools have individual cultures, and in some cultures, schools are very much willing to have parents interact and engage. In other places, it, there hasn't been a history of it, so they're standoffish. And one of the things that they did very well was distinguish between parent involvement and participation, right? And this kind of goes back to a conversation that uh, uh, was had earlier with uh, Professor Hill and also with Epstein around home-based and school-based types of interventions and recognizing that parents may not be the ones who can bring in the cupcakes to the classroom, may not be the ones who can volunteer on the field trip, but they provide things in, at home that create continuity between messages of the community and at school. And largely, Lewis and Foreman suggested that there were some race-based dynamics to this. What I want to do is ultimately find the middle ground between them. As a dominant model of parental engagement in sociology, we often start with background characteristics. One's socioeconomic status, speaking about LaRoe's work, one's race, Lewis and Foreman's, or one's place, the city, the setting, urbanicity, thinking about work like Marion Orr and others. And then ultimately, some have argued that this leads to child-rearing styles, which ultimately goes into the question of how institutions receive you. Schools are places that decide who matters, just like every institution. When you walk in, it's a reading of credentials. It's about looking at how a background is perceived. Is your family new to the area? Is it a long-standing area? Is there a tradition here? It is equally about the ways in which a history has played out. Does your individual and personal history matter into how you engage schools and do schools perceive it? And ultimately about the formal and informal rules of participation. How is it acceptable for parents to participate and how is it unacceptable? And then lastly, they say this essentially ends up going into a uh, desirable or undesirable outcomes. Do you end up getting your child into the algebra class that you would like them to be in, or are they placed into remedial math in seventh grade? I want to argue there are a couple of things that are missing very much in this type of thinking. First, they're usually either race or class base, as if people with races don't have class differences, or people who have class differences don't have racial identity simultaneously. We have to get out of this thinking and really look intersectionally at how these matter. 
Two, they're often unidirectional, assuming that one's background leads to practices, which leads to engagement, which leads to outcomes. And in reality, I'm going to argue that these processes go in one direction and back the other and bounce around because they're dynamic. Three, they underconsider the way in which parents and other adults respond and adapt to situations. Parents who are actors who are both caring and uncaring deal with the responses that they receive. It also underconsiders the role of parental networks and the dynamics between parents. If you are part of a parent group, such as a PTA, you may have access to sets of information, and that information can be stratified from other groups that need it, such as when decisions on class placement are made, such as when decisions on field trips, et cetera. And then lastly, it doesn't really talk about the variation in the degrees of success that occur. Because in reality, oftentimes, parental engagement is tied to educational customization, but you don't always get what you want. You can't always mobilize those capitals to the fullest extent. So I provide an, an alternative model to think about this, in which I start out by really saying schools perceive family social backgrounds. If you're in a, in a, in a county such as Albemarle, you may be of uh, an African-American background, and the immediate presumption begins that as an African-American family, you are coming from a low-income background, right? If you look at some of the achievement data that exists for this county, you'll look and you'll see the lines for free and reduced lunch, as well as the line for African-American score performance, are synonymous in terms of a pass gap, about 13 percentage points. So teachers and educators who have been inundated with sets of data say, oh, I see a black kid, I see a poor kid, I already know there's something wrong at home, right? When in fact, there's a whole heterogeneity that we need to be dealing with. Second, of course, there's this notion of child rearing style, which I think is really tricky because it's difficult to figure out what parents do at home, yet educators actively try to perceive it. When I was in the field, when I would talk to, about the different ways in which students were perceived, teachers tended to boil it down to, well, their situation at home is this, and I'm pretty sure that their parents are checking their homework or they are not. When I asked, have you had home visits, have you done any of that, they're like, no, but you can just tell, right? Either teachers have a crystal ball or we're going back to these overarching notions of stereotypes and treating them as cultural competency that leads to inequality. Additionally, what happens as families come in, particularly minority families, economic and poor families, schools as institutions have to receive them. Are they viewed as a widening of the community or are they viewed as a threat or a challenge to the community? How do we deal with the suburbanization of poverty? There are now, according to the, uh, the Brookings Institute, there are now more poor people living in suburbs than in inner cities. How have our schools responded to that and really try to parse out what, what are the, the, the resources necessary to make sure all schools are connected and all families are connected? And lastly, in this bouncing back between perceiving background and rearing styles and institutional reception, schools have the ability, I argue, to shape parents into two particular categories. And these categories come from interviews with parents, which I call consumer and beneficiary roles. What's important for, uh, that I want you to know is that these roles are constructed. These are not natural things that families just emerge into, but it usually involves how successful you are at getting the education you want for your child and then in response, rationalizing or deciding your approach therein. And ultimately, this is what leads to uh, uh, results. So first, a word about beneficiary. Beneficiary status tends to be concentrated uh, among poor families, African American families in diverse districts, and particularly, it's a notion of being a secondary citizen or not being a fully equally incorporated or considered. Secondly, uh, folks who fall into a beneficiary role or status tend to start to believe and trust in the system, using their own personal histories and narratives suggesting that the school that I went to before was not the greatest, but this one could provide my child with more opportunities. A rationalization of forward mobility, though not necessarily equal to um, a belief that their, school, uh, that their school is serving their child as effectively as it could. Third, it is ultimately a position that comes from circumscribed customization. The idea that I went in, I fought for that algebra class, and they let me walk right back out that door. Right. And third, it is, uh, fourth is classified by marginal influence. On the other side is the role of the consumer. Right. Those who find themselves in a consumer role are often perceived as the desirable parents. They are perceived as the parents who know how to work the rules, but also are allowed a greater levity to work around the rules. Second, they concentrate on customization, the idea that what they need for their child, that schools are there to serve their children, right? 
and that these are customizable resources. Those are the ones who show up into the office and say, well, I know there's no way my child is in Ms. Johnson's room. What can you do for me? And they wait. They're the ones who are often considered the advocates, but of course there are limits to this advocacy in major ways. And they tend to be the folks who are most results driven. When I started to do uh, an analysis in speaking with different folks, the term consumer came up because I was asking parents about their role in education and how they saw themselves. And one African American mother who was affluent said, well, I see that my role is about selecting what schools you want to go to, what classes you want to take, how they're going to prepare you for life, how do you manage the teachers, what complementary skills outside of the school do you need to succeed in life, from academics to athletic to social. For me, I see myself as a coach slash mentor. But really, as a consumer, I see myself as that. The teacher is not only there to serve my child, but to serve me. Right. And in this way, it's almost an idyllic representation of consumerhood. But uh, it, it, it would be absolutely wrong of me to suggest that being a consumer is easy or accessible to all. First, because those who are consumer tend to be located in, in families that have higher levels of education, right? have negotiated with school systems and work with them actively. Two, have higher levels of SES. Three, come from predominantly white backgrounds. And four, have a historical presence in a particular school system. If you're new to the district, your ability to customize and negotiate tend to go down, particularly because of knowledge of the system and also the, the social capital to actually make things happen. In the nightmare version, what we must avoid are the consumers who look like this. Right? This is a political cartoon that suggests in 1960 when a child failed, it was brought to the child, and in 2010 when a child fails, it's brought to the teacher. With the increased high stakes environment, consumers are often saying, this is my school, this is my child, what did you do to mess up? I think there's a middle ground that I'll get to very quickly. The middle ground is about A, increasing access to education related social and cultural capitals. How do people know what's available at school, and how do people mobilize to get that? Two, making sure that there's an evenness and completeness of information that travels out to all families. Not just the families that you see normally coming to PTA meetings, not just the families that you see normally engaged in some school-related activities, making sure all are reached. Third, a transparency with educational customization possibilities. Let's be clear about what you can and cannot change about a child's schooling. Let's make sure that parents know that equally and that they can abide by those. And four, a clear and equitable process for school-based involvement. How do we make sure families know what they can do, when they can do it, and whom they should speak to? So I have 10 questions for parents or advocates, uh, and this will be in my conclusion because I'm running over time. I apologize. The first, what are the programs or curricula that the school offers and who is responsible for each? In most situations, schools are so complex and so organized or disorganized that information never reaches parents, right? It reaches selective sets of parents, but not all. Two, are the programs and curricula that have been uh, offered, have they been discontinued, and if so, why? We see a large number of provisions that were offered initially through No Child Left Behind that were targeted at the most disadvantaged students have been discontinued from under-enrollment and things of that sort. So what can be done to shift that? Three, oh, that's not clicking. Oh, there we go. Are the goals of the program clearly stated in a way that families will understand? When you're dealing with families of a diverse set of backgrounds, making sure language is clear is key. Oftentimes, language is, uh, uh, is implicit in suggesting that a science group or a community will, uh, will help your child versus saying explicitly, this may not be mandated for your children's academic development, but it helps in these ways. Five, are families adequately apprised of the requirements to maintain good standing within programs? Six. How does information about education resources get to parents? What are the pathways? Is it just backpack mail? Is it mailing? Is it emailing? Is it robocalling? In most of uh, in the couple districts that I've looked at, it tends to be a singular focus of communicating to parents and suggesting, well, they'll find out or they won't. Seven. What are non-traditional ways that uh, what are non-traditional ways that community ca uh, communication can be used to reach the families that aren't traditional that don't traditionally get involved? And eight, importantly, what are the barriers to attendance at activities? Nine, are there multiple opportunities for families to become aware of school-related happenings? And 10, are there multiple opportunities for families to cross the social networks that exist that are often race-based and class-based to create communities of collaboration? In closing, I think the way that we have to move forward 
is rethinking parental engagement. One, making sure that we acknowledge all parents have an interest in their child doing well. It may be a self-interest, but we can move it to a community good. Second, this concern for the child need not be in the competition with other families. In uh, the particular district that my book is concentrated on, families perceived if another group gets something, my child loses out. Third, schools improve with greater levels of parent engagement on all levels, but let us acknowledge parent engagement is not a panacea. Right. It helps some, but it cannot transform for all. And seriously, we have to invest in economic, social, and cultural capitals if we want schools to be enhanced and transformed. And lastly, parent engagement and community engagement are dynamic processes that allow us to experiment and figure out what works for our school and what works for a particular district. It's not a one size fit all model, but you have to find the size that works for you. Thank you. Next up, we have Bernard Harrison. He is the Executive Director of Community Engagement with Albemarle County Public Schools. He also serves as the founding president of 100 Black Men of Central Virginia. He has taught on middle school and college levels and served as a middle school and high school principal. Welcome, Bernard. Good morning. Quite a different view from up here. I uh, do appreciate uh, our colleague here on the panel speaking to Elmore County in terms of the relevance, being from New York and speaking to Virginians. He did take the time to do a little research to kind of uh, make his comments relevant to this local community. He did talk about Elmore County Public Schools, of which I work, so I'm just going to spin on that just a little bit. So uh, this school division surrounds this city of Charlottesville, and uh, there are approximately 99,000 citizens. We serve uh, about 13,000 students through 16 elementary schools, five middle schools, of which there are about 3,000 students, three comprehensive high schools, and one charter school. Our per pupil cost is about $11,000 per student. When we look at uh, the students that we serve, uh, we're talking about 69% who are white, about 12% African-American, 9% Hispanic. And when you talk about the growth, the African-American population over the last two years has dropped from 13% to 12%. The Hispanic population has increased over the last three, four years from 5% to 9%. We also have about a 4.5% Asian population and about 5% other. So that's kind of Elmore County. So, um, what I'd like to do is uh, three things. I'd like to uh, offer a reminder of some basic fundamental practices that I think will increase the number of success stories for our middle school aged children. Second, I would like to respond with a few personal observations as a middle school educator, a teacher of five years, a principal of nine years, and to also uh, make those comments hopefully relevant to the reformers. How many reformers do we have in here? Consider reformers. Reformers, policymakers, and practitioners. So how many practitioners do we have out here? Check it out, okay? How many reformers do we have in the house? And how many policymakers? We got a whole lot of others in here. <laughs> okay, but anyway, <laughs> we're not claiming to be reformers, but we're always out there advocating for something different. And the third thing that I'd like to do is provide an example of what I would consider a successful middle school program that's, that's following those fundamental practices that I'm going to share with you uh, and also respond to this question through that uh, model program. Uh, how, do we, how can we best keep schools connected to communities during those most important middle school years? You know, we need our space as educators. <laughs> Personal space. All right, let's see what we have here. So, let me, let me uh, start with uh, what I would uh, suggest as something that matters. The C's matter for um, a focus on middle school programming. Uh, climate, culture, cultures, and community connections. The, 
those C's matter to our adolescents. They will tell you that they matter. For us as educators, there's a fine line between those top three, and we really need to take the time to understand the differences between those top three. School climate, it's what you feel, it's what you see, it's what you experience when you walk into a building, when you walk into that teacher's classroom, when you experience the cafeteria, what students do on a day-to-day -day basis, or when you walk into a guidance or principal's office. It's the use of displays of students' work. What do you see? What's the story? Photos of my minorities. How do you respect the minorities in the building? What are the pictures saying in your building? Classroom de decorations. Are they exhibiting any sort of, of uh, communication about the value of the content that's being taught in the classroom? And what are the images that are being posted throughout your building about role models on a local or national level? These objects and impressions depict the story of what's developmentally important to you as a leader in that school for what, you, what the story should be told to your stu students because that's their community. That's their home away from home. So for those uh, policymakers in here, practitioners, it's important to keep in mind that the climate impacts student engagement which impacts attendance and discipline. Attendance and discipline impacts student achievement and teacher satisfaction. The second C, culture, which reflects assumptions, values, and beliefs as the norm for the holistic development of the adolescent. His or her social, emotional, physical, intellectual activities. You know, um, as, a, as, a, as a middle school principal, I may define culture as perceiving, as something that's perceived of managing ideals and attitudes. So I'm managing culture if I can manage attitudes, my belief. Let me do something in terms of an expression of managing attitudes. This is a middle school principal right here. So in his school, this is the guy with the blue shirt on right there. In his school, you know, he's, he may do announcements the first day of school. And in his school, he can broadcast throughout the school through video technology. So just imagine him sitting behind his desk, you know, establishing managing attitudes. Good morning students good morning I love you guys I want to welcome you to the most exciting place in this area you know why because we have the best students we have the best to best teachers we have the best parents in this area everyone begins today with straight A's everyone has a 100% attendance and everyone in this building starts out without a discipline history our golden rule is we respect everyone. For the reformers in the room, you know, communicate the power of the influence of the principal on establishing climate and culture. Based on my experience, middle school students excel in settings with clearly defined structures that allow for flexibility based on their interests. Just as key word, that's, there's fairness built in. You must have fairness for that middle school student to buy in. The third C is the need to be respectful of the different cultures within the school. What teachers bring to the table, what students bring to the table, desire respect. And that should be done 
through a purposeful approach with inclusion of diversity built into the climate and the culture. It should be noted for the reformers and policymakers that most teachers believe that they are knowledgeable of the various cultures represented by the students in their classrooms and they value the differences of their students. However, based on my experience, in general, they struggle with identifying the routine strategies for giving students choices in assignments around their interests, values, and backgrounds. So, we've done a great job as educators in identifying the standards for what should be taught. It is imperative now that we shift to that accountability around how instruction is delivered to our students with differentiation that's taking advantage of the diversity in the classroom. So, the fourth C is about using the community to enrich opportunities for students and teachers. Central office administrators, principals are required to provide continuous improvement strategies. It's what they have to do. You don't do it, find something else. So in terms of developing these community connections, if you are looking to establish partnerships, you need to be able to align your ideas, your practices with the division's goals and the school improvement plan. And principals will love you. Everyone's trying to get into a school because of their research, because of their project, because of their profit for profit program. If you can show evidence that you can connect to what the school is doing, to their vision goals, strategic plan, it'll work. So, schools consider at least four components when evaluating new initiatives or community partnerships. They're gonna ask basic questions. What's the identified problem? And how significant is that problem to my school? What does the current research say about the problem? And what are the components for successful models? How do we get teacher buy-in, community support, and the necessary resources to do what we need to do? And what are the expected student outcomes and how will they be measured? What I'd like to do is share a successful program that includes the four C's. The identified problem was the achievement gap of African-American males. It connected with the division's goal of eliminating the achievement gap and measurable outcomes for every school in the school division. The program title is M Cubed, which stands for Math, Men, and Mission, was designed to provide African-American young men in grades five through 12 an opportunity to discover new ways to experience success through math and mentoring. Now, the research component considered the impact of the four goals of the program. Um, the leaders looked at how do we answer the questions to address the goals. So how do I increase the number of African American males in upper level math classes? Five minutes. How do I teach a rigorous pre-algebra curriculum to African American males? What's the research saying about that? So how do I build that healthy relationship be between the home and school? And Dr. Hill talked about that mistrust. How do we address that through research? And how do we establish a systematic system for achievement? So you look at baseline data, for example, okay? 32% of the African-American males were enrolled in upper level classes versus 71% of white males. So bottom line, how are you gonna have an impact on that?
So the program emphasized a culture of high expectations and planned instructional strategies to honor the African American culture of students enrolled. Movement was welcome, role play, collaboration, and critical thinking were routine activities. You are gifted. You are expected to own your own learning. This is a class that's being taught at the high school level, the creation of culture to impact competence and confidence. The intervention strategies began with a required two-week summer academy designed for African-American males to sell through excel through hands-on, project-based, and inquiry-based teaching and learning approaches through a rigorous pre-algebra curriculum. Community partnerships were established with State Farm Insurance, Elmer County Public Schools, 100 black men of Central Virginia, and the University of Virginia's math and instructional technology departments. The collaborative efforts created a positive and healthy teaching and learning environment that indirectly impacted other C's, such as connections, character, and caring. Mentors from the 100 black men of Central Virginia provided a year-round mentoring to assist with strengthening relationships with the home and school for that systematic support that's needed, that was needed after the two-week academy. The mentors served as daily role models, teachers, and guest speakers during the Summer Academy. Their emphasis was placed on self-identity, self-pride, and discovery. So when we look at the outcomes, we have to go back to those four goals that we talked about. And so the first goal was about increasing the number of African-American males in upper-level classes. So the data indicated that, you know, the first year of the program, you only had one African-American male in algebra, and you had one in geometry in the entire school division. So where are we right now? Last year, eight in algebra, three in geometry. Progress. Now, you might say, man, that's flat. Think about the school division. 12% African-American enrollment, so that means 6% male enrollment. So a given eighth grade class may have somewhere between 60 and 75 African-American males. So have to keep it in perspective. So increasing the number of African-American males in upper level classes. Over 90% of the students who completed the summer academy were enrolled in the upper level classes. End of year grades, from the first year of the program, those students who completed their average math grades, 2.7. Currently is above a 3.0. So the second goal of the program, teach to a rigorous pre-algebra curriculum. So throughout uh, the, the time period of the program, there's been a collaboration with the University of Virginia's C Curry School Math Department, Almar County staff, in terms of identifying what should be taught, how it should be taught. The third goal of building a healthy relationship with the home and school, that's very, very critical because what we've seen there is parents who now are more engaged, parents who are now more empowered. Okay, we've done workshops on parental empowerment. You're not just sitting back allowing the system to dictate what should be, but you're getting information about what you expect of the system. Parents who, whose children have been a part of this program can, can now recognize what quality instructional materials look like. So when they go into a classroom and a teacher provides a handout, Okay, for students to recall, they know that, that that's not at Bloom's higher level of taxonomy in terms of challenging their students to think at that synthesis level, to think critically. So they challenge. We've taught them how to challenge in a positive sort of way the results that they're looking for. And that fourth goal, establishing that systemic system. So you can do it in terms of a two-week summer, summer academy. So what happens during the course of the school year? That's where the mentorship comes in with the men of the 100 black men of Central Virginia. So, this is a program that's been recognized as a high scoring program for innovative best practices, proven and practical solutions and new ideas by the American School Board Journal's Magnet Program. Thank you for listening to me. And I did meet the time, that's probably the first time I've ever done that. Thank you so much, Bernard. Next up, we have Milbury McLaughlin. 
She is the David Jacks Professor of Education and Public Policy Emerita at Stanford University. She also is co-director of the Center for Research on the Context of Teaching and founding director of the John W. Gardner Center for Youth and Their Communities. I think this is the first conference I've ever been to that I haven't had to explain what youth development means and then defend it in the context of school reform. So, yay, you. <laughs> um, I want to talk about data, and my argument is that data is the glue for the kinds of community connections we just heard about, and that data are the agenda for the kind of collaboration this panel is talking about, sort of school and community collaboration. I'm drawing on the experience of the John W. Gardner Center at Stanford and our community partnerships. But first, let me uh, set the frame and back up a bit to one of my favorite visuals, and Charles Smith will recognize this as something from the Forum for Youth Investment. I think Karen's been using this for 10 years. Um, it's helpful in terms of thinking about what the problem is. What is the problem for school and community connection? And the cube, the famous cube, uh, really plots a developmental, developmental space that looks at age and it looks at time and it also thinks about the multiple domains of youth development. And again, I'm so glad I don't have to explain that. Um, why should schools be involved with social and emotional learning? Who knows? Who would have thought? Um, the, the problem the cube um, suggests here, though, is that at the system level, we really don't do a lot of thinking about this entire space and using the community resources to address the entire space and to monitor these developmental domains and acknowledge that uh, for a young person growing up, around a third of his or her time is spent in school. Uh, research shows a third is spent in bed alone, sleeping. Um, I don't know about that research entirely, but sleeping for a third of the time. And then a third of the day um, is out there in the community. And as we all know, and we've talked a bit about today and yesterday, for young adolescents and adolescents, they just aren't as attractive to community uh, caregivers as are the cuter elementary kids. Um, just as parent involvement tends to fall off in the middle grades, so does community um, investment in concern for intention to the young ladies, young ladies and young guys. So next, what is the community um, that we want to pay attention to this space? Who's responsible for this developmental space? And we heard yesterday a reference to Uri Braffenbrenner, and this is also Braffenbrenner in, in terms of thinking of community in the full sense of an ecological perspective that takes all the groups and all the agencies, all the individuals with a stake in the outcomes of youth they know and serve. And that the problem really is to communicate and coordinate these community resources that takes into account the whole child not just the child who goes to school, not just the child who might be involved in a boys and girls club program, not just a child who might have special needs, but the whole child. Collaboration, um, years of research has shown, is especially difficult uh, to bring about. And I have to say, even though I'm a, an educator in a school of education, that the education se sector is notoriously isolated. And it's a stance that's exacerbated, as we've talked about yesterday, by a high stakes accountability environment and a focus on academic outcomes. But take a look at this. I, my students know I call this the Petri dish, because it really is the community Petri dish of schools and social services and justice and work and community-based organizations, family, faith, recreation, that all are responsible for the developmental space of a young person. Um, what is the problem then? If, co if collaboration is such a good idea, why is it so hard to do? Uh, the program I want to talk about and use as an example is one that actually we started with middle schools. But what is the problem of youth development? Um, whoops. I'm getting ahead of myself here. From a youth development perspective, uh, we heard the word silo a lot yesterday, and we're all familiar with them. But what we found in our work through the Gardner Center is um, silos, <laughs> silos are even more impermeable than I ever imagined. It's a balkanized world out there. 
And we were stunned to find that even for the same youth in communities, um, youth serving these agencies, literally the same young person had no idea across institutional boundaries. Um, social services didn't know what was going on in schools, and boys and girls clubs didn't know what was going on in schools. Health agencies weren't aware of the resources that were already in the schools, just really um, tough boundaries. And as a consequence, um, again, this is not surprising to any of you, what you see in communities, we talk about the ideal of a web of support. Well, that web of support has huge holes in it. And largely those holes are because the resources and supports available to young people are disconnected and sometimes they're even contradictory. Um, I would say every community we've worked in, we've encountered uh, an example of, in this one instance, mental health kind of just rolling right into the schools and across the schools in a way that, that were not supportive of what was going on. Um, so one reason is institutional isolation and regulations support that. Um, community investments support that. Uh, we've talked a lot with stakeholders about sort of professional definitions um, of what responsibilities are and what are outcomes. That supports that. But at the root, I think, is the fact that collaboration, as a colleague of mine says, is an unnatural act. Um, it's an unnatural act for lots of reasons, and again, no surprise here, um, but I'm setting them out really as, as challenges that we faced in our data project. One is turf issues, um, you know, who's, who's feeding at the trough, and if you get something, I'm not going to get something else. So we have health services, you know, battling with welfare services, battling with the schools for they perceive the same resources. Very different institutional logics and languages. Um, we see this most particularly uh, between schools and child welfare agencies. Little sense of urgency to collaborate. Um, that especially in a high stakes accountability uh, setting, we've heard again from youth ser serving agencies, you know, my plate is really full and I'm just better off focusing on what it is I do. And, um, not interested in collaboration, or they've had a bad experience in the past. I think most folks have had uh, experiences with collaboration that sound like your first parent-teacher meeting of seven people showing up and it's a waste of time. You just spent seven hours or two hours on, on uh, no agenda. So my argument is that data provides the mechanism to somehow loosen up and um, bring community stakeholders and collab collaborators together to support support um, collaboration. So I'm talking about the Youth Data Archive, uh, which is a project at Stanford and the Gardner Center. It operates through a university community partnership that's really quite an unusual one, and that's in a way a talk for another whole panel because it's created tensions at Stanford and it's created tensions in the community. Um, but it's a cross-agency, it's, it's about 10 years old now. It's a cross-agency integrated data system of public and private administrative data. We have uh, elementary districts, high school districts, um, post-secondary, we have health, we have mental health, we have juvenile justice, welfare and social services, we have community-based organizations such as the Boys and Girls Clubs in the Y, we have arts, we have music, we have a whole bunch of outer school time, which is why I love Charles Smith work. We have city parks and recreation, and essentially all of the elements that are part of this developmental space. Uh, young person's institutional ecology. Um, a really cool piece about the data archive that, that distinguishes it from other um, data link systems I know, it's linked at the individual level. So I can look at Patrick and I can find Patrick, um, this very Patrick in the justice system. I can find you in the mental health. I can find you in education. I can see where you went with the boys and girls clubs. And what that lets you do is really move away from a main effects analysis and talk about an event analysis that for a collaborating partners really gives a better opportunity to think about where do I invest? You know, look at Patrick compared to Jay over there and they seem to have some of the same investments but different outcomes, how can I understand that? It also lets you just aggregate at the individual level so you're not just looking at a class or a neighborhood or a community but you can begin to look at the kind of patterns that we heard, heard talked about on this panel today and all yesterday too. It supports uh, a cross-institutional community-level view of youth and youth needs. Um, it defines what I call a youth sector. Um, it, it flips the denominator, so the denominators in an analysis aren't any longer schools, justice, et cetera, but the denominators really are this, this youth sector. The Gardner Center has 
guiding principles, um, and again, I'm happy to talk more and more about this, but I just, just a little bit. It's unusual in the nature of the community university partnership. It's truly a partnership. It's not Stanford being a technical assistant. Um, it's not Stanford professors coming into the, into the, in the community with their own little pockets full of research questions. It's user driven. The partners own the data, and this has been a really critical part for us. Um, we do not publish anything. We do not give talks about anything until the stakeholders have signed off on these data. And I can't tell you how many conversations that has engendered at Stanford University. Um, but what we hear from our partners is that they could not or they would not have participated without these data use agreements. Another way in which it's unusual in my experience from the typical sort of academic pointy-headed research is um, it really is user focused. There's a whole line of research on uh, public administration and knowledge management that scratches its head and says, how come all this great research isn't used in the community? We've had all these great findings and it's just they're not being used. And in part, the reason is that the questions being addressed and the ways in which they responded don't fit with the community needs. They aren't the community's questions and they aren't presented in a way the community can relate to. So again, this has been a learning experience for us, but the Youth Data Archive really focuses on youth and the user's needs. What do users need to know? What can they do with it? What are the policy opportunities? The Youth Data Archive is a long-term commitment. Um, we don't sort of parachute in and then move out. So we are there for a long time with our community partners. And this lets um, we, us, enables us to do analyses that are iterative. And it's the final piece um, that I think distinguishes it and that we're most excited about after 10 years is a focus on community building ourselves. So it's not just about analysis, but it's also about how this partnership can not only strengthen our work, but strengthen the work in the community. Let me just give you some examples of, of the work we've done. Um, these are recent ones, and I can supply any of these. Uh, we have little community-focused issue briefs if you're interested. One was um, combining preschool data, the first five in California, with uh, school outcomes through third grade. And we were able to identify uh, which of the elementary kids um, who did or didn't, um, you'll love this, Jay, it was almost a randomized trial, not quite. Um, but some of the kids in the community participated in, in, in uh, First Five and some of them didn't. And so we were able to look at the third grade and see that kids who had had this preschool um, environment did consistently better than school. And these are the same schools. We have the population so we can simulate this treatment and control group than, ki than kids that did not. Now, ironically, this is California. So just as we finished this analysis that we're saying, yay, First Five, great investment state, the state pulled first five. Um, but based on these results, what happened in the community was the state or the, the county health agency stepped up and began to invest in preschool. The district itself began to invest in early education. So we missed the mark in a way in terms of supporting state investment, um, but preschool supported. The next one that I particularly care a lot about is uh, court and community schools, which in California serve adjudicated youth. We combine data from the juvenile justice and the court and community school system with um, district data. Never before had these two data sets been combined. For all of these, by the way, it's the first time they'd ever been able to look over the wall at another institution. And our findings, when we presented them, there was not a dry eye in the room because what we were able to show was there were no handoffs, no transitions for these adjudicated kids coming into the regular school system. They simply weren't seen. Um, in fact, by California law, you don't even have to admit them. If Bernard does not want this kid in his school, he doesn't have to take him. Um, so the data were stunning, the data were unsettling, but as a result, these two partners, these two parts of our community came together um, and said, these kids are all our kids. We did a piece on physical activity and academics, um, combining data for the first time, uh, showing, da da, the more physically fit you are, Thank you, Michelle Obama. Uh, you know, good grades are associated with that. The one that has been th the most um, difficult to do, but also the most generative, is one we've just finished on chronic absenteeism, in which in California means you're absent more than 10 days, excused or not. We combined elementary and secondary school data. Again, first time it had ever been combined to see pathways. And what we saw was you can see in the kindergarten, absenteeism in kindergarten predicts school graduation as well as uh, GPA throughout. And it's just that, it, I guess, if you're not in school, you aren't learning. But it, that it, you'd never catch up 
never catch up. So the districts and the health departments on this have really been interesting. The district soup, this is California again, no, no money. Um, they've now had a great outreach program to parents. Um, they've hired a district attendance person. And this is in the context of stripping their whole district office. And the superintendent argues this hire will be cost neutral because they will be getting kids in school. We have new partnerships um, in the community between the schools and the community's wellness committee. And um, just before I left, this is, may sound picky. You can, oh, that's a bad thing to say because it's about head lice. Um, <laughs> parents didn't realize that if a kid has head lice, he can still go to school. And so, I mean, just getting that kind of information out. New involvement from the health agencies who didn't realize they were part of the problem. And, da-da, we got a new partner. Um, there was a district that's part one of these sending districts who always was worried about what happened to their data, what would happen to them, and what they could see was that wasn't going to be an issue. A great, uh, a great pathway analysis between San Francisco Unified School District and City College in which they had been pointing fingers at each other. City College says you send us students unprepared and district said, you know, um, you don't treat our students well and guess what, you know, there are issues on both sides. So whole new policy surrounding that. So um, before she holds up the zero, um, what have been challenges? There are three big buckets of challenges, um, political, organizational, and technical, and the technical is the least of it. The technical really isn't an issue. The political uh, issue has been huge. Um, community partners trusting each other, trusting university-based researchers, trusting that they weren't going to get screwed um, through the analyses. Organizational has been, again, huge. Leaders were absolutely critical. Unless the leaders of the youth surging agencies were involved, it just didn't happen. Um, churn, organizational churn, and regulatory um, issues. But we all would say um, that it's been worth it. So beyond the particular analyses, and again, I will share any of these with you, um, what we've been pleased to see over a five to six year period in our community partners is the whole sector is really growing in, in a very um, exciting way. Um, strengthening partners' capacity to support youth. Um, each one of them has expanded their data collection and improved metrics. For example, we've done some work with community schools. Um, all the participating partners have now changed their metrics so we can actually work with them. Um, they've requested focus groups, they've requested information about outreach. These are middle schools. These are all the community middle schools. Um, there have been new learning opportunities. We've sponsored data talks. Um, some of them um, have been fun for us in the sense we realized halfway through a briefing that no one in the room beside us understood what a regression equation was. So, it took a while to explain. Uh, our community partners really wanted to use on, uh, on state, state data, they wanted to use the raw scores, and we were presenting z-scores. They said, why would you use a z-score? That took about 45 minutes, but now they go to their other they go to their colleagues and talk about z-scores. Um, and it's a capacity building thing. They really are able to use data in a different way. Increase coherence. Um, we've seen this again. I mentioned the alternative education and the, the foster care kids, the San Francisco Unified um, K-16. Uh, just last week in the community school where we started all of this, they've now started what they call a fourth, fourth shift. Um, first shift, second shift being morning and afternoon, third shift being after school, fourth shift now being six to eight. This is uh, the local church, it's police, uh, police athletic league, community volunteers, uh, new community partners, park and rec coming in to say nothing's happening for these kids and this has all again been, been data based and the youth sector itself has been strengthened. Here's a quick picture, um, what it looks like. Um, so what have we learned um, in minus one second about launching and sustaining um, a youth data archive? Relationships, 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 and it, it just, it takes time and it's ongoing. It just never stops. Um, secondly, without agency leader support, um, is impossible to implement. Um, a middle manager will often say, it's not my job. It's not my job to get you the data. It's not my job to do this and that. So without a superintendent, without a principal, without, in one case, a juvenile court judge, it just doesn't happen. A tough lesson for us is it has to be an urgent problem, uh, urgent in terms of the stakeholders. When we started out, we thought we had some great questions. The community didn't think they were so great. Didn't matter. 
um, in, a, a design-build approach in which a piece of analysis isn't solving a problem, but rather presenting often new problems, and that the early adopters really are the brave ones. Um, but we've been able to, I think, demonstrate value um, in a way that it's, it's almost exponential at this point. And let me conclude um, by just returning to some core youth development principles and talking about why data really matters. One, the cube has to hang together. <laughs> can't have a cube that's going off in different directions. So without, the, without data, you really can't attend to that. Um, secondly, the youth development needs and resources really are a local issue. Whoops, thank you. I got so nervous with my clicker here. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a local issue and that there's a local advantage and it needs to be tweakable, it needs to be kind of um, talked about in local terms. We were interested that local folks really wanted a local replication of national data. They couldn't go anywhere with national data on dropouts in terms of advocacy. And finally, that without these kind of data, you can't construct um, a youth sector. You're still focused in silos, so thank you. Thanks so much, Milbury. So our last panelist is Bill Milliken. He uh, has helped develop the legendary Street Academies, one of the earliest alternative school models. He also co-founded the organization Communities in Schools, which is the nation's largest dropout prevention network. Further, he is the author of The Last Dropout, of which you received a copy at registration. Hello. Uh, I only have one chart, but the reason I'm standing up here is I'm ADD, and that's about as long as I can sit. But I'll eventually point, point to this. I, I wasn't real sure when I got the invitation to be here. I don't get invited to uh, colleges very often. In fact, I think once before, and I didn't know why in the world I was coming here. Uh, and b being here with you the last day has really helped me tremendously. I, I uh, learned a lot. And one of the things I learned uh, about why I was here is I now understand why I got kicked out of middle school. Uh, uh, Dr. Eccles helped me tremendously when she spoke because every condition she talked about, my mom was brought in to my middle school and, and they said, uh, he can't handle the work, which meant I was dumb. And that stuck with me my whole life. And there's lots of me in those middle schools uh, who got the wrong messages. Uh, teacher told me uh, before they kicked me out that I wasn't raised right. And I said some things I shouldn't have said to her. And uh, I went to Moose Jaw, the principal, and I, uh, they were allowed capital punishment in those days. <laughs> But after that, I was out, but uh, it was a caring adult. And if you don't hear anything else I say today, after 50 some years of journey, working with and for kids, uh, Melby just said it, it's all about relationships. I'm alive because somebody came in my neighborhood and believed in me, and there's nothing more powerful than somebody believing. Only five of my friends made it to 30 years old without being dead or in prison. And it isn't that I didn't come from uh, resources, it's because I, I didn't know how to learn. And uh, the other reason, I wonder why you asked me here, I did eventually go back to school and finish three freshman years of college, uh, which again totally qualifies me uh, to be up here. Uh, but in the next few minutes, I just want to give you a larger frame for what we've been hearing the last couple of days, and I've been trying to listen at a deep level. Because if we don't understand the context, I heard that word a lot, and we don't understand the frame of why we're in the situation we're in, we'll come up with some nice models of change, but we'll never be able to systemically change what we're doing out there. So my education ended up being 11 years from 1960 to 71 in Harlem. I went there because a friend of mine who was helped at the same time I was helped, he owed some time in prison, so we felt it wouldn't be good to start our youth movement if he got picked up. So he did that, I went back and did my three freshman years. But we moved in together, and we had one gift, and that was hanging out. 
I still haven't found a degree. Maybe you'll give me a degree in hanging out. But that's where it all starts, the change. And in those 11 years, I got into education not because I knew anything about education, it's because we were focused on the kids. What turned me around, what turned Vinnie around was somebody willing to walk through the valley of the shadow of adolescence and love us into change. And whether I, I recently spoke to all the attorney generals in the country, I said, if you can't use the word love, then you don't want me here, because that's the only transformational thing we have. The kids have to get turned on to living before they're gonna get turned on to learning. I've learned, not academically, but I've learned a whole lot. And one was that it starts with relationships. So I housed kids for about five and a half years. We had 30, 35 young people living with us, not because I knew anything about housing, but it's because Vinnie said, hey, we got a lot of kids out there living on rooftops. And I learned a lot about community. I learned about relationships. I learned a lot about community building. I found out I couldn't read well, but I could write, and I wrote a thing about tough love, of learning how to not only love kids and care about them, but create structures that have some content to it where you have kids want caring, but they also want a structure. And I learned that the hard way as some of the kids died that were living with us. But we backed into education, not because of education, it's because we saw some of these young people begin to make it. But when they started to make it, they were so far behind in school, the only alternative was to sell drugs. So that's how we got into the storefront schools. I wasn't as nice a person in the 60s. And I said some things that would keep me out of the institutions because I couldn't understand. I was living with kids where I, by the time I was 25, I'd buried uh, and spoke at a funeral for 12 of them. And I couldn't understand how 40 blocks away were the wealthiest people in the world. So I got angry, and I, I, I was blaming people. And I had to deal with that anger. And we started our own schools because they didn't want our kids back in school. And that little school became a number of schools. People said, how'd you learn replication? I said, I had a little school. It was called, actually, we called it a, a liberation school. So if you're learning marketing, that's not a good name. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought it was cool. That's what the people, and it was over a couple beers with some Columbia students that were volunteering with us, said, maybe you change the name, you'll get some money. And I said, well, what do rich people call their schools? They said, academies. <laughs> Hell, we put the sign up, and I was in my first boardroom I'd ever been in. Eight weeks later, I'm sitting at the Ford Foundation. They're calling it a miracle. So just change the name, and you become a miracle. <laughs> And we learned replication. All these things are important. How do you replicate? I didn't know how to replicate, but it replicated because the riots hit. And to be honest with you, uh, the community decided I should be the liaison to the business community on Wall Street because I was white. And they figured they'd listen to a crazy white man rather than them about why they ought to help replicate what we were doing. So we ended up having IBM schools, AT&T schools, American Airlines. I was learning to build the bridge between these two bubbles, these two different worlds. And so replication was being learned. So then I was asked in the early 70s, just to go through it quickly, this was the pivotal point. I was asked to testify in Washington. I was nervous about that because the only time I'd ever been there, I got arrested. So I thought, but they didn't arrest me this time. It was a good cause, it wasn't anything illegal. Uh, but it was in that testimony that I didn't know what I had learned. They said, we wanna know why so many of your young people met, made it, because it, not only did we end up with 18 schools in Harlem, the Lower East Side, Bedford Stuyvesant, we began to open in Detroit, uh, sh Chicago. It, it just began to spread, because good news spreads just like bad news. So they were wondering why so many of our young people made it. And what could you do about it? First of all, I said, what I said here, and I'll say it till I die, I said, I had the gift of getting kids turned on to living, and I got some smart people to teach in our storefront schools, and the combination of the two, they gave them the content, but it was in small caring environments, and you need to replicate those small caring environments. Second thing is I said, the theory in America is crazy. And this is something we all have to deal with if we're talking about scalability. And I heard you say it, that 
The theory of change in America is you've got to make it every two to three years. I said, I don't know much about history, but I don't know any meaningful change in history that happened in two, three, or, two, three or four years. Government tells us we have to change it every two to four years. Foundations told us you have to do it in three years. So you see, at my age, you're just seeing the same things being over and over and over repeated. You can't sustain it and grow it. So if you want to read the book and learn, we laid down all the things we learned about this. So I'm, I'm not up here to give you all the, all the explanations, but if you don't step outside, you can't understand the situation you're in. I'm going to give it real short version. I said, education is going to become the number one issue in America. I said this in 71, and you're going to think it's an education issue. I say it's a breakdown in community issue. You've got to deal with the education, but what happened to us in the real short version is right after World War II, the troops, instead of going, it's nobody's fault, instead of going to the farms, we shifted, they began to go into cities. You had the GI Bill kick in, you had a lot of uh, people making money, and they were growing, and then you have a little thing called suburbs happen over there in, in Long Island or New Jersey or somewhere, and then there was a great book written about that time, Man, Child, and the Promised Land, that talked about folks coming from the Alabamas, the Mississippis, coming up to find promise and land in the North, and they didn't find either. The theory is it all blew up in the middle of the 60s, or toward the end of the 60s. What I said was, what we did in that period is slowly begin to pull apart the safety net for children in this country, which was the extended family in relationship with the faith community were the mediating structures. So Alma Powell says yesterday about quoting what Mrs. Clinton written of, of the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. We said, we're losing the village. First, you've got to build the village. And I warned that schools fell into the vacuum that was created by this breakdown in community. And I warned the teachers were going to become, be asked to be mother, father, sister, brother, social worker, hall guard. And that if we didn't come and bring the community around the schools and build a safety net of resources, then we weren't going to bring ultimate change because we had to free the principals up to be principals and the teachers to be teachers. This little diagram is what happened. They said, well, what would you do about it? And they talked us into going into the system. They said, you can't sustain something that you're picking the kids up after they already dropped it. How do you do it inside the system? They said, number one, you've got to think differently. First of all, the school, if it's in the vacuum, you said it again. People have the boys and girls and clubs in one part of town, the Urban League in another, the faith people in another, the medical people. I said, a kid needs a PhD in systems to get help. Let's bring this, the resources to where they are. But that was the beginning of it. But I said, what's missing? And I say this, and we have legislation that if it ever gets passed in Washington, the secondary school, I, we don't need to just collaborate and partner. We need to integrate the services. And that little person you see there, we introduced, as I told Cisco Systems, you came up with a relational router, I mean, a technological router. We came up with a relational router. Every school in America needs a router in there who works for the principal, who's integrating all those services and is working with that site coordinator that's in other schools along the path. So this model, as we gone in, and, and by the way, we start with 100 kids. We now have 1,300,000 kids a year in 3,200 schools. So we've proven that you can replicate that and you can look up the data we just went through. A, a five-year longitudinal, I couldn't even spell longitudinal, but I knew it would cost a lot. And we just went, we just went through that. So we got the data. And the data, and I will end with this because we don't have time. But when I talked to the attorney generals, I showed all the data. We keep kids in school who weren't supposed to make it. We got the data that, that, that they're prepared for the next level. They're, they're graduating on time, et cetera. But I said, one thing you don't have to study, and that's where I began, and don't waste your money on it. If a kid doesn't have hope, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to hurt you or hurt themselves. Vinny, that started this with me, was putting a needle in his arm. I was hurting other people. We were given hope because somebody believed in us. And that's something that they were able to finally measure, that when you have a caring adult and a caring environment, you begin to tra transform the schools. And at another time, we can talk about how you do that and spread that by having super routers 
in every community that are brokering these resources to get them to the schools, we need to rewire our system and bring the resources to the schools and to the kids that need it. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful panel. And at this point, it looks like we have about 15 minutes for some questions and answers. So if you don't get your question uh, asked during this group period, I just want to encourage you um, to you know, think about opportunities to have conversations over lunch about these issues. And James, if you can just introduce yourself. James Pierce from the Boys and Girls Club. I'm wondering how often the super routers or uh, the cross-agency data teams occur informally rather than formally at first. Where does the big bang happen with all that? Well, come together because they're hungry for community. But the calling it a router came with years ago, meeting with Cisco Systems just before the, the bubble burst there in the 90s. And I spent a year working my way up to meet with the head guys. And I walked in there thinking I was just going out with the biggest check I'd ever gotten. And, uh, but they started firing questions. And one of them was, what makes you different? And I put an X on a piece of paper. I said, I, I, they said, what's that? I said, that's my router. And I, they said, no, we got the router. And I said, yeah, you figured out a way we're going to collect the information, organize it, and disseminate it. I can call Houston, Texas, and call Cynthia Briggs, who for the past 20-some years has given her life as a super router with the business community, the school system, the mayor, the parents, all being there, freeing her up to rewire the delivery system in that city. And it takes years. But now in over 60 schools, there's a router, elementary, middle, high school. So until you reroute route the resources, then we're going to always have these individual things that work but not have a way to, to replicate them. If I could build on that with an example that boys, involves the Boys and Girls Clubs and just, I hadn't thought about a wider router. Um, and uh, in this community table that involves these partners, the Boys and Girls Club is one of the partners. And a concern um, in our first partner community, which was 63% um, Hispanic, 80% um, low income, et cetera, was a lot around literacy and proficiency. And the district had a program, uh, after school literacy, and the Boys and Girls Club um, didn't have a formal program, but they had lots of opportunities for kids cross age around foosballs or whatever to, to practice language. So we collected data on uh, proficiency levels at both the school district and the Boys and Girls Club. And <laughs> it was with some embarrassing analysis. It turns out the Boys and Girls Club was much better than was the district at raising language learners to proficiency. And I mentioned that the stakeholders own the data. It took a long time for this analysis to make its way to the school district. But the, um, the bottom line was a, a new partnership between the Boys and Girls Club and the district and a recognition that informal language is as important as formal language and that the Boys and Girls Club really was an after school setting that was much more um, friendly and youth friendly than was the, this was a middle school, than was the middle school after school. So whole new policy, new rewiring um, involving community partners. Go Boys and Girls Club. <laughs> <laughs> Are you waiting for a question? One, one other thing, uh, along with the relationships in the router, those who are out there making this stuff work need to work with legislators, with corporations, foundations. Until they change the reward system, we're going to continue to have our, I heard you say partnerships are a natural act between two non-consenting adults. <laughs> And that if, was an elaboration. That was a great, <laughs> yeah, but that's what you said. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, three of us came uh, together. Um, um, City Year, um, John Hopkins uh, School, and ourselves. Uh, we had the integrated system delivery and the site coordinator or the router John Hopkins on early indicators so that we knew when we were 
repositioning or bringing the resources there, we knew that we were getting the best health systems, the best, and when they were needed. And then three, city year. And all three of those, there was three companies, the federal government and the United Way, all were there celebrating this great increase in the growth of under that umbrella called Diplomas Now. And the data and the outcome are incredible. But what I pointed out, I said, you four funders rewarded us to work together, not in our silos. So we need to get people to reward us to work together. That will make the process a lot quicker. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Dave Rogers, and I'm a local middle school principal here in Albemarle County. And uh, we've had so many great panels, and we've brought together so many great thinkers around different perspectives on this issue. And the last one seems to have just opened up that we, I don't think, is on the agenda. And so I'd like to ask you your thoughts about how we do this. And that is, how do we bring, uh, you've obviously been very successful at bringing uh, some corporate interests in to building a sense of uh, financial community around the success of children, regardless of their needs. How do we now start to bring the government in, whether it be federal government or local government or state government, uh, to partner with universities, with school systems, and with social agencies to make this program, to get a router for us in, in, in just in place in terms of the way we operate and do business? I appreciate hearing anyone's thoughts on that. You're the activist. Come on. <laughs> I want to make sure I understand the question. Are you asking what the role of government is in the process of routering? Uh, no, I think I have an opinion about that anyway, yeah. but I, 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 I think what I'm asking is how do we start to leverage that in a way? Each of you has been able to do that in one way or another. How do we start to leverage a more cooperative spirit, uh, which springs from the notion that it really is about what we do with the children that keeps things going, so how we keep them succeeding. How do we pull all those uh, partners or those unconsenting and non-consenting uh, agencies together in the best way. What, I, I am the founding director of the John Gardner Center, and um, John Gardner, who was former secretary of HEW, you know, blah, 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 all, I mean, all these amazing things, and Bill knows, believe powerfully that democracy devolves and that the grassroots is, he would say the grassroots, um, is where it, where it really sits. And he t would talk often about wholeness, embracing diversity, and he and I, he used to come to my policy class as a guest speaker, and it was always the, and it took me two years to understand um, what he meant about the role of government, I think we call it government. And here was the cabinet secretary um, under Lyndon Johnson who felt the most important role of government or the most important kind of part of democracy and where the action happens is at the community level, at the local level. He felt the role of state and local government was to support, to support that action at the grassroots. Um, and what I began to understand um, um, after kind of many, many years of conversation with John, but also beginning to work at the community level around these data projects, um, is the local government, I mean this as a way of a rallying call, for you, local, what happens at the local level is just different than any other level of government. And um, there's what I call a local advantage of things that can happen at the local level that can't happen in any other level of government, which is why the Youth Data Archive is not state or national, it's local. Um, there's a tweakability. There's not the, I mean, you can kind of say, well, it didn't really work over here. We can kind of change it, and you have some data to inform that, as opposed to what would have to happen at state and national levels. It would have to be a, a cabinet meeting or a legislative meeting. It would have to be a huge turning of a, of a vessel. Um, what I also appreciated talking to local advocates um, is that the partisanship, I mean, look at the elections, the partisanship that exists at state and national levels, federal levels, is not, it's not the same. It doesn't exist at the local level. It's not Republican, Democrat. It might be um, whether you're from youth services or you're from the schools or are you from the parent community, but there's so many opportunities for a fulsome, rich, 
conversation that mobilizes a community. And I, I, um, I think I said this to Charles a few years ago. I mean, I'm so excited about this Youth Data Archive that it makes me wish I were 30 years old. Because <laughs> I really think it's the response to the institutional isolation and the community conversations that need to happen. So I would say, I'll give you one other shot. And Altria is really on the cutting edge of moving into this space. But I think until the, the corporate world in particular doesn't, it, they need to move from a charity to a change model because they end up creating more silos and more charities and more things out there. They need to le use their money and influence to channel their power to affect the delivery system that comes from federal to state because the majority of what any of us are doing, unless we leverage that and get that streamlined, then we just end up further fragmenting the community. So we, we need them to begin to look at this as a change issue, uh, not just morally, uh, but economically. Hi, my name's Philip Donovan. I'm with VMD Architects here in town, and we specialize in K-12 education, and we thrive on information, attending conferences like this to create a better collaboration with educators as we tend to try to, to understand what you need from the physical environment that you're teaching in. And, and my question really goes to, you know, we, we've got the data and there's this unspoken theme that runs through that, that we do have to improve our schools. Um, teachers work with what they have. And my question is, how does the physical environment of the school the school, and, and this is really a question that, that spans all the panels um, for these two days, how does it affect the data that you're finding? Um, and how do we begin to implement, in, in this case, um, more of a physical presence within a school for community? Um, we, we are developing schools that have um, clinics, public clinics that are accessible all day long. How do we get out of the, the mode of having a seven to three facility and better um, develop a, a collaboration with architects with school divisions on on improving the physical environment and, and how does that what is that data that you're collecting um, what are the results you're seeing how does it affect that data I don't have any data but as a practicing um, middle school administrator um, if you understand the middle school philosophy of uh, uh, small school um, or school within a school concept, um, um, collaborative planning time for um, teams of teachers, interdisciplinary approaches to teaching, one of the reasons why we haven't done a good job of implementing the middle school concept is because of the facilities in which we're asked to implement those. Just a, a comment on that. Um, I think as you and I talked earlier, um, the, our, par, our first partner district has moved to a community schools model in their, in their middle schools. And this is a community that has had a really difficult time engaging, especially undocumented parents um, in, in the experience of their community schools. And they've used physical space to do that. Uh, the Police Athletic League um, and other community partners have set up shop um, on the school campus in ways that parents can come in and out and not worry about the man, not worry about um, immigration status, but they've integrated the space um, so it, the parents are kind of in and around their middle school kids' um, education in a way. And They've requested new data from us. I mean, this is where I meant kind of expanding the capacity. Um, the schools now want kind of parent focus groups, the kinds of things that, that Nancy talked about in terms of what do we want here from our schools and such. So it's, it's um, the way the physical space is being used in this community school model um, really is generating, generating requests for new kinds of data and analyses. If I could just add. Oh, there we go. Uh, I would just add, I work with a school in Detroit, the Boggs Educational Center, that's coming into being, and it's a, it's a, a, a site-based or place-based educational system in which everything is really built around the local ecology of Detroit. And so they had to make hard decisions about where they would locate, right? So 
DPS closes, Detroit Public Schools closes the school and they say, hey, you can have this school to open your school. And they went to the community and said, what do you think about us occupying this and building up a new tradition? And they were like, that entire building has this history and this legacy, right? If you just go in there, we're gonna think you're the same thing warmed over, right? So finding a built environment that seems new and collaborative because they're very much, they're trying to do things around healthy eating and the integration of different services. And they're like, the way in which most of the schools have been built in Detroit are very much uh, an outdated model. The alternative, because it's Detroit, is that there's a lot more space, so there's opportunities to take over non-traditional spaces or to arguably build something new. Okay, think, I think we'll, there, oh, go ahead, last yeah, there's, there's, there's looking at school climate and there's looking at school environment. We've seen school climate change because we began to realize we didn't have a youth problem, we had an adult problem. And what we learned was that when adults come together, they happen to be African American and white or Latino and white or male, female, and they care about each other and work together as a team, not just as somebody delivering glasses or food or whatever. The kids begin to change. The environment of the school begins to change. They feel safer, and I believe it affects their brains and their learning because I feel safe. But you can't give away what you don't have. And if we are a community, we can't ask the kids to be community. So they create their own communities. The other you hit on, which is a much longer concept, is the environment of some of these schools these kids are having to come to that are so drab and they're killing our kids, some physically, other emotionally and intellectually because of the ecology of the school. And that's a big movement that's starting out there and people are beginning to realize it. So Okay, well, thank you all so much. And at this point, we'll break for lunch. Thank you.